Um, it's a pleasure to be here this morning and uh, exchange a little about the future. I mean, the future, um, looking from Brussels is, uh, how should I say, looks a little bit like a bumpy road. But I think that we all believe that when we remain united, there is a lot that we can do. Um, if we uh, look in the area of um, exchange today, I will certainly focus my uh, intervention on insurance and pensions. What are we doing? What have we achieved? How does it matter? What will it bring to industry and to consumers? And uh, what is in the pipeline? What is the way forward? Um, let me start with insurance, maybe to um, make a link with uh, Olaf's intervention on, on mainly focused on insurance. And I will not enter into the details of uh, Solvency II, as this was a very uh, well done by, by Olaf in his presentation, but maybe to uh, pass a few messages after one year of full application of Solvency II. So what exactly is Solvency II and why do we have Solvency II? And everybody knows here that the most knowledgeable person in the room is the one who framed Solvency II, and that's Karel, of course. <laughs> um, so Solvency II uh, entered into application after a long process uh, on the 1st of January 2016. It is a highly sophisticated uh, regulatory framework, and I would even take pride in stating that we have the most sophisticated regulatory framework in the world, uh, which is a, a risk-based uh, regulatory framework um, suitable to the ever-changing environment in which insurers do operate. Um, solvency II should not only be seen as a, a highly um, sophisticated prudential framework, but also as the piece of regulation which opened up the market for insurers in the European Union. And this is something very important for the European Commission. All our thinking today is done in order to uh, try and bring the priorities of the uh, Juncker Commission investment plan to life. Of course, we have the Action Plan on Capital Markets Union, but when we look into the application and the further shaping and adaptation of Solvency II, we think, of course, growth, jobs, long-term investments. Um, so we have um, a balance in the system between, of course, the opening up of markets and giving insurers more opportunities and I will also later speak about opportunities that we want to give to our insurers on a worldwide basis and in other major jurisdictions. Opportunities for insurers, but a system which is prudentially sound. And why is it so important to have a prudentially sound system? Because we need to ensure trust. And because we need to ensure policyholders' trust and consumers' trust. Of course, the issue is to find uh, the right balance. Um, the um, data or the information that we have after one year of application of Solvency II are quite encouraging with very good uh, results which were communicated by insurers in the European Union, uh, many of whom published their Solvency Ratio. Um, we have, however, seen a few um, failures of some insurers and we are looking into into this and into the consequences and into how can we possibly address the consequences of such failures but generally um, the the system really works very well and we are confident in the strong positioning of our insurers this is also very important of course when we discuss at the international level I may have a little disagreement with Olaf in uh, uh, regarding the, the previous intervention. I do not think that we are treating insurers as traders. And if we look into the priorities of the investment plan and the action plan on capital markets union, um, I would point out to the fact that on the very day of adoption of the action plan and capital markets union, we adopted the specific measures for insurers. And this measure was incentivizing insurers' investments in infrastructure projects by 
recalibrating the capital charges corresponding to insurers' investments in this type of projects, of course, within the uh, remit of the standard formula. Um, why did we do so? Well, because we can see the position of insurers as major institutional investors. They are the most powerful institutional investors in the European Union, and the Commission's intention was, by doing this uh, recalibration, um, to encourage insurers to invest in long-term projects, which will bring more growth, which will bring more jobs in the European economy. So I, I don't really see how this is compatible with the perception that insurers are being treated as, as traders. So we have uh, lowered capital charges uh, regarding these um, investments, and we have seen uh, some good signals from the insurance community that they were very interested by this, and uh, some stated their intention to invest in infrastructure projects. We have also, we are in the process of uh, introducing another uh, recalibration of insurers' capital charges regarding investments in infrastructure corporates. So this is, you know, when you have the stage of infrastructure project and then it matures into corporates. We also want to incentivize insurers' investments and, of course, give them the possibility to obtain higher yields on their investments, which is extremely important. Whilst at the same time, preserving the right institutional balance, and we have done so on the basis of a Yopa technical advice, and we have, we do have eligibility criteria, notably regarding the projects which can benefit from that type of incentivization, which should ensure the reliability and the soundness of uh, the projects. So we've worked on uh, insurers' investments in infrastructure. Uh, we are following the negotiations on a securitization, on a, a simple, transparent, and standardized securitization, and we will proceed with further uh, recalibrations of uh, the capital charges on insurers' investments in that type of uh, investments once political agreement will have been found in between Parliament and Council. And we are working, we are uh, assessing the Solvency II implementing measures, and we are preparing for an important review to take place in 2018 of these implementing measures. We have worked in order to prepare for this on the basis of stakeholders' input, and I would really say here insurers' input, provided during our um, consultation um, the call for evidence that was launched together with the Action Plan and Capital Markets Union. And this call identified a certain number of barriers um, that we will try to address uh, via the review of the standard formula. To that extent, we have addressed a call for advice to EIOPA. Um, we have focused on, on three areas. We have addressed a call for advice on you know, how to how could we further simplify the functioning of the standard formula? We have tried to identify and we are trying to find solutions to the issue of the proportional application of the rules, particularly regarding small insurers. And we are about to address another uh, call for advice to EIOPA uh, regarding insurers' investments in uh, private equity and uh, privately placed debt, uh, where we will want to look into criteria which could possibly allow us to um, offer a, a recalibration of uh, the, um, the capital charges relying on this, on this investment. So you see this is ongoing work. Um, we, will, we will deliver in, in 2018 and of course afterwards uh, there will be the revision of the level one, so solvency two, and the long-term guarantee package uh, from 2020. Um, all this, of course, is a, is a very uh, important undertaking. Um, I, I regret I can see uh, Gabrielle is not yet there, but I would like to underline the prominent role of EIOPA. 
and uh, really thank IOPA for the excellent cooperation uh, that we have with them, both for the preparation of technical advice, but also I would like to underline the role that IOPA is playing and will continue to play uh, regarding supervision and the coordination of supervision. So EOPA has really worked, focused on regulation in the first years uh, and until full application of Solvency II. And of course, now they are providing technical assistance on some issues, but they're really also shifting onto uh, more supervision, which is extremely important and also important when one looks into the international dimension. Um, as I mentioned international, there are two topics on which I would like to say a few words. First of all, the uh, global international scheme. We are, of course, following works within the International Association of Insurance Supervisors, notably for the shaping or the design of international capital standards. Um, we have followed the work on uh, the high loss absorbency, but as you might uh, have already heard about it, uh, the work on the HLA is being postponed um, to a later stage and uh, the focus now within the International Association of Insurance Supervisors is more on the framing of ICS from trying to obtain ICS 1.0 to framing an ICS 2.0 for 2019. Apologies, this is a bit technical, but it's, it's important in the, in the framework of this. And of course, um, when we follow the uh, discussions within the International Association of Insurance Supervisors, we of course um, steer to get some sound prudential framework for insurers at global level. But our priority there is also, and my priority when I attend meetings and meetings of the EOPA Executive Committee, is to make sure that whatever is being developed by the International Association, we get a real level playing field for our insurers on a global basis. And we are particularly vigilant that, of course, as you can imagine, other jurisdictions might try to orientate standards which are being developed in a way which will be more preferable maybe to their industry or which might um, lead to having some additional buffers applied onto our industry why such buffers would not apply to other type of industry. We are extremely vigilant. We don't want to go that way. We are open, of course. We are encouraging efforts um, to establish prudential, sound prudential rules at global level, but this shall not be to the prejudice of the European insurers. And I'm very, very strong on this. Another important issue uh, regarding international cooperation may be a point of information on our bilateral relationship with the United States, where I'm particularly pleased uh, to inform you that after uh, some very uh, hard and tough and uh, intense negotiations, uh, we agreed on a covered agreement with the US at the beginning of January on insurance, reinsurance, and exchange of information between supervisors. And through this agreement, uh, we are bringing an end to the uh, collateral that European reinsurers were or are still facing when providing uh, reinsurance, when entering into reinsurance contract in the US. So this is a major uh, barrier which is now in the process of being lifted. Um, we have um, agreed on mutual rules on uh, group supervision notably and uh, we have adopted a, a model provisions to serve uh, for future memorandum of understanding in between European supervisors and American supervisors. In the European Union, we are in the process of uh, uh, preparing for a, a council authorization to sign and provisionally approve some provisions of this important agreement. And we are, of course, following the developments of um, the internal adoption process in the US. This agreement was notified to Congress on the 13th of January, and we are hopeful that we will soon be able to cooperate 
with our American counterparts to bring this agreement to life and to get it implemented. Um, I won't underline uh, the uh, costs that European reinsurers had to face uh, and the opportunity costs, I mean, all the lost investment opportunities um, created by this collateral, and I'm particularly pleased that we have managed to find an agreement on this. Um, coming back onto the uh, European scene, the um, distribution of insurance products, uh, IDD, the Insurance Distribution Directive, uh, entered into force, is in the process of uh, transposition. Uh, it uh, regulates uh, the sale of all insurance products and contains some uh, specific rules regarding um, insurance-based investment products. Um, we have received a YOPA technical advice and we are in the process of preparing some implementing measures. Of course, we are fully aware of the fact that some of these are particularly sensitive and I guess we all understand each other that uh, we, of course, stick to the decision of the legislator when preparing implementing measures and are not going to renegotiate nor rewrite what the legislator decided in the framework of the Insurance Distribution Directive. On PRIPS, uh, which was uh, mentioned by Olaf when I entered the room, um, of course, also a very, very sensitive file. A parliament uh, rejected the RTS, which had been prepared by the, sorry, I, I should not use these technical terms, the, the implementing, the technical implementing measure um, or regulatory standard, which had been prepared by the uh, European supervisory authorities. And uh, the commission is um, following this rejection, uh, working uh, to prepare some uh, a revised version of uh, this regulatory technical standard in uh, order to allow stakeholders to prepare for the full uh, implementation of the regulation, the PRIPS regulation, uh, which entry into application has been uh, postponed by uh, a few months. Um, let me turn to the area of pensions. Um, I will not address uh, state pensions. This is not within our area of competence, but uh, would like to focus on occupational pensions and personal pensions. Um, regarding occupational pensions, uh, we um, renegotiate, we revised the um, directive relating the activity of occupational pension funds in the European Union. We obtained political agreement in June and the directive was formally adopted by the co-legislators in December published and now we are in the process of uh, member states um, transposition. Uh, this will be a very important uh, new uh, step of the legislation and we are confident that it will contribute to really, um, how should I say, improving the management of uh, pension funds and also empowering members and uh, beneficiaries of these IOPs. Um, a major um, new work stream is the one uh, generally designated as PEP. So this is the issue of personal pensions. Um, or we, we have looked at that market and of course observed that this market is really underdeveloped in the European Union, which creates of course a lack of investment. Lack of investment means lack of growth, lack of investment opportunities, lack also or insufficient uh, supply of personal pension products, um, particularly on some markets. Um, of course, insufficient level of savings by European citizens in view of retirement, um, and barriers within the uh, single market to those who would like to offer products on a pan-European basis. We have uh, amply consulted on this topic. Um, our public consultation was conducted last uh, summer and spring, uh, very successful. We had uh, not far from 600 responses. Um, we had divided the consultation in, in two um, parts, one addressed to citizens in their personal capacity, and we had uh, 484 responses, I think, from citizens, which is unprecedented for European consultations. 
we had very good uh, responses from all professional associations and very strong support, be it from stakeholders, industry, uh, insure, the insurance community, the pension, uh, the, the asset management community, the banking community, um, supporting uh, a European initiative in that area, consumer associations supporting us to launch an initiative. Uh, we organized a public hearing in October in Brussels, which also confirmed, again, uh, the, um, the, the, the general support for the Commission to launch an initiative. And yesterday in Brussels, we had a, a workshop which was organized by our consultant. We commissioned a study to um, obtain a mapping of the uh, tax situation in the member states, and uh, we have asked the consultant to undertake a feasibility study. And yesterday's workshop uh, contrib contributed to nurture the uh, thoughts, uh, the, the preparation of this feasibility study. We had an excellent uh, representation of stakeholders. Uh, uh, Insurance Europe was there. Several uh, insurers, insurance undertakings were represented. Uh, we also had um, the asset management community represented. The consumer uh, organizations were represented. We had academics. We had really a, really a very um, wide um, intellectual uh, community with a lot of experience and know-how and, and the day was extremely rich. So we are, we are working on this. We are hoping that we will be able to present a meaningful uh, proposal uh, more or less at the time of the uh, CMU midterm review by the end of June or in the summer. Um, the, the road in front of us is not an easy one and uh, we should not shy away and pretend that everything is, is rosy. Um, we would like to be in a position to offer a tool to those providers who would like to develop a personal pension project uh, product, sorry, which could be offered um, on different markets, and a product which would be simple and which would be um, cost efficient, um, interesting for the consumer, but interesting, of course, for the provider. We are trying to create, to offer new market opportunities for providers because we know how underdeveloped this market is today. Um, now, there is a, there is only a small little obstacle in our way, and that's called the tax legislation. Uh, the, the, the differences in the tax systems, which are, of course, an obstacle to being able to offer a fully portable pan-European pension product. How could we possibly obtain that a product um, be um, carried into a different member state and could uh, benefit from tax advantages in the member state, uh, in, the, in the new member state? This is an extremely difficult question. Um, I should really insist on the fact that when we are working on the PEP, we are not thinking of forcing harmonization. We are not thinking of modifying the existing, mem uh, existing models in place in some member states. Some member states have a very, very developed model, institutional model, uh, on the second pillar, I mean, on, on occupational uh, pension funds. What we want to do is not replace this, but it's to complement. And there could be interactions in between um, occupational pension products and personal pension products. So we are working very hard on this. Um, we are grateful for all the support that we keep receiving from stakeholders and the very useful inputs that we get. We have a lot of exchanges. We try to know about past experiences. And we will do our best to come out with a proposal for an, I should say, an optional statute. So it would not impose on possible providers it will offer an opportunity for those who would want to use it to develop new products uh, in the European Union. And that would, of course, potentially be a major tool to develop uh, long-term investments in the European Union. Um, 
Last but not least, uh, the Commission will soon come forward with an action plan on retail financial services in a, within a few weeks, uh, following our green paper on retail, um, retail financial services and uh, an extensive public consultation. And um, this action plan will be focused on three priorities, um, increase consumer trust, reduce legal and regulatory obstacles when um, which are which providers are, are facing which stakeholders are facing when uh, providing uh, financial services abroad and support the creation of innovative uh, uh, an innovative digital world digital world overcoming all the barriers that uh, financial services providers are still encountering today so this is a heavy agenda, and as always, uh, we will be delighted to continue working in, in good exchange and in good interaction with all stakeholders. Thank you very much.